the Bitcoin group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome the panelists, including Antonopoulos, Bitcoin developer and commentator. Davi Barker from shinybadges.com. Hello. Chris J. from Feathercoin. Hello. Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Good to be here. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Thanks for having me. Derek J. Freeman, Peace Propagandist from Peace News Now. Peace, y'all. Will Pengman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. And now, Issue 1, Mt. Gox Bankruptcy, Part 4. The price fluctuated over the weekend on a false rumor of resumed transactions, but by Monday, it was over. Mt. Gox was no more. Their web page was blank, and they deleted all tweets. A united statement from the remaining Bitcoin exchanges and the Bitcoin Foundation led to questions of solvency. And now, on Friday, February 28, 2014, Mt. Gox has declared bankruptcy, with a loss exceeding 850,000 bitcoins, more than $63.6 million. Andreas Antonopoulos, your thoughts? Well, I look at this two ways. Uh, the first is that a lot of people got hurt by this, uh, and um, I have a lot of empathy for the people who got hurt. Um, I hope that uh, some restitution can be found, uh, at least partial restitution. It's going to take months to unravel this mess. It's going to be a complex investigation with forensic accounting and bankruptcy proceedings going on. Um, it doesn't look very hopeful, but at the same time, I think it's important to focus on the people who have suffered a great tragic loss. Uh, and then the second part is really simple. Uh, Carpellus has wasted our time, our focus, and our energy on his bullshit for far too long. It's finally over for Bitcoin, at least. Uh, Mt. Gox is out of the picture. Stop paying attention to him. Stop wasting time. Let's move on. Let's innovate. Let's focus on the exchanges that are properly managed. And uh, that was the last Goxing. And the uh, reign of terror of Gox is now over. Davi Barker. There's been a lot of price manipulation as a result of Gox. If you look at the averages to other exchanges, Gox has always been the outlier in the group. And so now that they're gone, I'm excited to see some real price discovery and we can start to get back on track to what Bitcoin is really worth. Chris J. Hi. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking those numbers are on the screen. You thought you knew what you had, but then it turned out that they weren't really there. Sounds a lot like the banking industry, doesn't it? So I hope that this will be the last time that we learn this lesson. And I hope that we can learn the right lesson from this and teach the banking industry how it should be done. Namely, that uh, this organization is going to fail and we're going to let it fail. And someone, preferably Carpellus, if he is culpable, if it turns out uh, that he is, that he should go to jail for this. Um, not like what, the way we handled the financial crisis in 2008. So I think that's what we can learn. I'd also say that um, a lot of people were still on the IRC channel today on the MT Gox support group and I, I made a comment on Twitter, perhaps it was a little bit unsympathetic, that the theft was still taking place, that people were still wasting their time. My advice is um, to just let go of, of, of the coins that you, you had on there and just to assume as if you're not going to get them back. It's easy for me to say, I mean I did have some coins on there, not very many. It's easy for me to say, hard for you to do, I know. Um, but otherwise, you know, all these rumors about where they might be, um, I think it's great that people are doing all this forensic accounting, by the way. It's very encouraging that we now have the tools and everything we need to sort these economic problems out for ourselves without relying on third parties. Um, but I think a lot of people are just torturing themselves by getting nostalgia for the future that they thought they had with the, with the money that, that got lost. So, yeah, like Andreas, I'd like to extend my sympathies to everyone who's been affected by this. It's interesting, like you say, Chris, that it's it was a support group for tech support, but now it's actually a real support group. It's the a therapy group, Gox, yeah. The victims of Mt. Gox are many, and they need our support in the same way as any other victims of a large-scale financial crime need our support. Yeah. 
Uh, can I just say one other thing as well? Um, because there were lots of people in the MT Gox IRC channel and on Reddit that were, were predicting this. And, and they said, look, there's, there's something not right here. The way the support art staff are acting, they said it even before it, it became apparent. In fact, I remember people last year predicting that Gox was a bit, was a bit dodgy and that something, something wasn't right. Now, I think we should actually go back and try and find out who those people are. These are people who really respect the truth. They know how to stand up to authority and they tell the truth, they tell it early to the people that need it. If, you, if you're in a, a work environment, okay, where your boss builds a climate of fear, just walk out, right? Ask some hard questions and if you get some pushback, just walk away because the reason they put up those barriers is because they don't want you to find out what's on the other side of that anger. Um, so that, that would be my advice. I hope we can learn the right lessons from this. Christoph, Atlas. Well, I, I find some of the, the information that's coming out still to be very confusing. Um, there's this 850,000 Bitcoins lost figure, and if Mt. Gox has been open for four years, that comes out to around, I would say, 580 Bitcoins per day on average. So the question is, how could they possibly lose that much um, over this period of time? Uh, they're supposed to be settling their books at the end of each month, so what exactly is going on there? Um, and that includes having Japanese regulators looking over the books. Um, if the funds were simply lost rather than stolen, there was some, you know, very significant mismanagement of private key data. Um, this is, you know, uh, uh, 900,000 bitcoins were mined between uh, January 2009 and July 2009, and, and we could be looking at a situation where all those coins are suddenly uh, gone from the supply. So I'm curious to see what happens with that. Um, for the regulators and the people that are, are looking to, to regulators to uh, uh, remedy this situation, to come in and fix the, the Bitcoin ecosphere, what I would say to those people is Gox was able to exist this long in a completely you know, disarrayed uh, state because of the barrier, barriers to entry that were in place uh, related to regulatory uncertainty, legal costs for potential new exchanges and so forth. Why are there no exchanges until very recently that are in, in New York? That's, that's silly. It's supposed to be the capital of, of finances in the world. Um, so if regulators think that they're going to come in and fix the problem, uh, the reality is that they hugely contributed to the, to the creation of the Gox problem. It's not just about uh, Gox and Mark Capellas, but it's also uh, lots of other things that have played into getting where we are, where we are today. Absolutely, and a great point, Christoph, that the lack of regulations led to a climate where only an exchange like Mt. Gox could exist. Without regulation, no better exchange could come in to fight them. Megan, Lords. Well, this has definitely been a tragedy, and I think it's going to haunt the Bitcoin community for a long time, um, and it also does a lot of damage to uh, just the overall reputation trying to get people to you know trust us that Bitcoin is the superior payment system and protocol um, and so it, it makes it a lot harder to get uh, you know mainstream people into Bitcoin I don't think that of course you know the Gox problem is going to get obviously hasn't killed Bitcoin and it can't kill Bitcoin but I am also curious to see the innovations that come out of this I think we're going to see a lot more uh, people and companies stepping up to help the people affected by Mt. Gox and put in better um, better protections for people who are new. I think a lot of the people who were affected were new users who just jumped in in the past couple of months and you know when you type in Bitcoin on Google, Mt. Gox is the first thing that shows up so a lot of people were just like oh I'm just gonna go with the first thing I see even though there had been these warnings for months like get out of Mt. Gox, like there's something wrong, there's some sketchy activity going on. Um, but I think in order to kind of build confidence, uh, we're going to have to see more innovations coming out that are going to protect people and even, you know, even something like, you know, having to do uh, security for them. I, I, I think there's a huge um, market there for uh, people who are more experienced with security, helping people who have no idea how to do it themselves. So I hope to see more of that um, and I think that will be a, a, you know, better solution, of course, and like what Christoph said, regulation and all that, often that causes that, and that, you know, in a way affected the stock situation. Derek J. The most amazing part of this Mt. Gox fiasco has been Bitcoin's resiliency. 
in reaction to it. They're, the price has been relatively unaffected. So despite how the lamestream media has been portraying it, just trading continues on other exchanges and life goes on. So my heart goes out to those who lost serious money. We're all wiser now. But my God, the, surviving the collapse of the largest exchange without a significant price drop, what a robust currency. Long live Bitcoin. Will Pangman. Yeah, I just want to echo some of the things uh, the other panelists have said. You know, I really am impressed with the forensic accounting it's, that's going on on a grassroots level. Um, just to see that this kind of activity exercised, which is which is possible with the Bitcoin protocol for the average Joe with the know-how to dig into the blockchain and do do some research. You know, from from their basement, from their um, you know, their bed with a pillow behind their back or something. I like, um, I, I just love the fact that this kind of a system is so opt-in, opt-out, voluntarily organized um, that it, it suits very well for, you know, all comers. So that's, that's exciting to me. It's encouraging. Um, I also am really eager to see, like Davi said, what the, um, what the actual price of a Bitcoin is now that we don't have $20 to $150 price spreads and, uh, you know, it's curious why that spread was so great for so long. Um, you know, just thinking about that, what kind of, um, I, I think, sure, it had some to do with dollars taking a while to get out of that exchange. So uh, the only withdrawal possible for convenience sake was Bitcoin. So maybe that should have been 10 to $20 higher on that exchange. But um, surely they were trying to make up lost ground there in, in Japan, um, you know, maybe trying to cover their butts it's amazing that um, that it just continued to get worse for them, despite seemingly having uh, the charade carry on for years. You'd think, you know, some they'd have some ability to catch up and cover their butts. Um, the price resiliency is also impressive to me. One hour of a major dip, and the price was basically back, you know, within 12. Uh, that's that was more impressive than the Silk Road. Um, you know, flash crash and recovery, in my opinion, earlier this year. Um, and I, I've heard from folks who are heavy into the trading space who have used Mt. Gox and other exchanges, but mostly Gox. And some of them who lost large sums of money, I've been told, aren't coming back to Bitcoin. And that really saddens me. I hope that doesn't end up being the case. I think it's too powerful of a technology for folks to stay away too long. I totally sympathize with why they might feel that way at this moment. And I hope um, I hope they can stick around and, and um, that there will be a nice little support network underlying them, uh, you know, that they have folks close to them that they can lean on in this tough time. It's, it's, um, it's tragic that the trust was shattered so, so horribly. There are a lot of warning signs, um, mind you, for about a year or more maybe. And I just think playtime is over, you know. The, the shoddy business models that maybe nursed Bitcoin along in the early days um, are going the way of the dinosaur quickly here. As quickly as Bitcoin moves, we're starting to see more professionalism entering the space. And um, amateurs, entrepreneurs, VCs, and, and all of them, uh, there's more professionalism I'm seeing across the board. And, um, you know, the shady characters and shady businesses um, can't last in a transparent environment such that Bitcoin provides. So... It's very exciting time in that regard, and um, my heart goes out to those who were hurt so badly in this. Exit question. Will we be talking about Mount Gox again next week? Andreas Antonopoulos. Well, I inevitably, we're going to be talking about this for as long as this investigation continues because the media will be interested in it. Uh, I hope that we will limit those discussions and focus on innovation. And the most important innovation we can do right now is programmatic solutions to security and uh, proof of solvency, cryptographic proof of reserve, multi-sig signatures for uh, escrow and backup and recovery of keys. Uh, security solutions that we can implement. This is programmable money. We can implement security like it's never done before, and we can make this the most unhackable and unstealable money ever created. Let's focus on that instead of worrying about the incompetence of one man. Absolutely. Davi Barker. 
I think that we'll be continue to talk about it. Um, it, it. I mean, as long as it continues to produce stories, I mean, we'll, we'll be talking about it. Um, but I look forward to the day when this is behind us. Absolutely. At some point, it's got to end. At some point, it's got to end. Chris, Jay. Yeah, what Andreas said. I think we need to take this as a marketing opportunity for a lot of exchanges so they can start advertising fractional reserve. If you're a customer of any of these exchanges, you need to demand it. You need to write to their help and their, their support emails, and you need to ask for you know proof of existence. What's it called, Andreas? Proof of existence or proof of reserves? Proof of reserves. Uh, Christoph Atlas. The discussion is going to morph from uh, the, ter the terrible catastrophe of Gox into how the industry learned from Gox. That's what we're going to be talking about in the long term. Megan Lords. Well, this has definitely been a learning opportunity, and I think Andreas summed it up uh, well. I'd really like to see innovations come out of this, and also with as much uh, propaganda as they're pushing out, um, you know, that's anti-Bitcoin. We need to be doubling up on our efforts to get out our propaganda. Uh, not really, you know, to be insincere, not propaganda, just reassuring people that, you know, the protocol is not broken. Derek, J. We'll be talking about Gox until there's some kind of restitution, but uh, we'll likely be talking more going forward about what customers are demanding from future exchanges. So one innovation I'd like to see in addition to security and transparency is a promise of restitution. Will Pangman. Yeah, like the other panelists, we'll continue to talk about Mount Gox as this uh, whole thing unravels. Um, it'll be interesting to see how um, the layers of the onion peel here and, and get to the bottom of what happened if we, if we ever do. I think it's far more likely that we do in an environment, a financial environment such as Bitcoin than, say, you know, the legacy banking system. So uh, getting down, getting to the bottom of things in terms of um, fact-finding and, um, you know, proper assignment of... Uh, uh, I hate to use the word blame, but um, for lack of a better word, and uh, you know the the professionalism that we're going to see come out of this, you know, we're even six months from now, I think, or, or once once the last chapter in this Gox story is written, I think we'll look back and we will chuckle about the kind of you know to steal a phrase from Andreas, the clownishness of this uh, this business. Um, you know, it was necessary to give us initial price discovery three or four years ago. Um, but uh, the businesses growing up around in this space, the more professional ones, uh, should give everyone um, encouragement. I'm sick of seeing the media talk about Mt. Gox, e equating Mt. Gox with Bitcoin. So as soon as that is behind us, um, that, will, um, that will be the signal that the, that the last chapters can be closed. And we're talking about... Bitcoin as a technology and the powerful businesses and, and partners and um, strategies behind growing this thing. Excellent. Moving on. Issue two. U.S. Senator wants to ban Bitcoin. The U.S. Senate that august and distinguished chamber has finally addressed Bitcoin and with a fuddy fever that would make Joe McCarthy blush. Senator Manchin has called for a ban on Bitcoin because it is highly unstable and disruptive. Finally, some recognition from the Senate. Is the fine senator from the great state of West Virginia right? Should Bitcoin be banned? Davi Parker. Come at me, bro. <laughs> I mean, what are they going to do? What are they going to ban? Uh, are they going to do house-to-house -house searches? Are they going to? What are they going to do? So you know, in my opinion, Congress is volatile and disruptive. So maybe we should ban Congress. <laughs> Chris J. I think uh, justice is there to give power. It's not. It should not be the reserve of the powerful. And that's what happens at the moment. Justice is there to serve the rich, the people that can afford it, and it's not there to defend the weak the ones that need it the most. 
Um, I think I was I was at Warwick University yesterday. Thanks, actually, to Tom because you introduced me to one of the students there who's looking for a speaker on a panel debate on the future of finance. And I have to say, my expectations were like I was kind of expecting a lot of kind of conservatism. Um, I was expecting people to be, you know, a bit, you know, critical of cryptocurrency. But actually, you know, the, these young students, uh, like 19 years old, were like really into it. And they were very, very curious, and they knew all about the 2008 financial crisis because their lecturers in, in the econo uh, uh, economics classes had taught them about it. They could tell me all of the reasons why it failed, and they were all of the right reasons. In fact, one student told me about a bank. I won't mention the bank's name because I haven't done my own diligence on this yet. But he said that they were currently at a fractional reserve ratio of uh, 40 to 1, which meant that they would only have to uh, their reserves would only have to be broken by about 3%. So 3% of the the loans would have to go bad, and you'd have systemic failure. And if that bank failed, then lots of other banks would fail. So why I'm saying this is that the way to prevent this from being regulated is to get this to young people. Like, we need to be getting younger people, like under under 18s, like people that are still in education, uh, to be setting up their own coins or writing on the the Bitcoin protocol itself, because then you're cutting off the regulators at the knees, right? Because they feed on students when they leave university. They go into to government positions because it's a safe job. You get a nice, comfortable salary, and you know it, it's. Uh, I don't. I don't want to swear, but um, Nassim Taleb calls it "fu money," right? So this is money that you make so that you can say "fu" to the system and then leave it, right? What I say is just leave it straight away, or don't even put yourself in that position because th th these are golden handcuffs. Okay, y you can't predict the future. And so you don't know what's going to happen. And I have a lot of my friends that I went to school with, I'm in my 30s now, that did go into banking, that did take the golden handcuffs, who then wish they hadn't. Because what they didn't anticipate was the recession uh, that, that came along. And then, of course, they didn't have all the wealth to move to the Cayman Islands or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's a mugs game. I'm not, I'm not particularly phased by this article. I read it. I wasn't particularly, it didn't interest me. I, I don't find this at all threatening. Christoph, Atlas. Well, I think most likely the senator is getting the ball rolling on some new laws to increase executive branch powers. Um, as a member of the banking committee, uh, perhaps he was encouraged by some bankers to you know, loft the threat of a ban uh, right at the time that Gox was collapsing to try and pile on and break faith in the Bitcoin markets. Um, towards the end of the letter that he wrote to uh, the various branches, he mentions systemic risk uh, due, to, due to a deflationary death spiral. And I've been telling Bitcoiners for a long time that they can expect uh, these kinds of complaints about systemic risk from the political class, and I think we can expect a bunch more of that in the future. Um, he also called out Silk Road as an example of anonymity and you know difficulty with law enforcement. And of course, that's a red herring. Um, the Silk Road and several other websites have been shut down uh, successfully. That said, I think that these markets are going to become more resilient. The anonymity technologies for cryptocurrencies are going to improve. And I think he is right to be concerned that cryptocurrencies will complicate the tax uh, situation for the political class, especially income taxes. Uh, but the real question, the real pertinent question, is which side of that fight is the moral one? Megan, Lords. I guess I've uh, pretty much summed it up. Um, I, did, I mean, I, I, I did I did expect this though, uh, with the whole uh, the the Gox issues and things like that. Of course someone's going to come out and be like, oh, we just need to ban it because it's so bad. Um, that's to be expected. I think this is typical political overreaction to something uh, and, you know, he's just trying to do what politicians do, which is uh, kind of please his constituents and be like, hey, you know, uh, yeah, we should totally ban this bad thing because a bunch of people got ripped off. But, of course, you don't see it. It's a very selective uh, application of the law. You're not going to see any politicians or bankers going to jail. Um, so I, I, I think he's just talking out of his ass about it. And, uh, yeah, good luck trying to ban Bitcoin. Derek J. Please mention ban Bitcoin. You might think I'm joking, but I am completely serious for three good reasons. 
One, if it's officially banned, then it can't be officially regulated by the sticky-handed politicians. I don't trust the bureaucrats to regulate technology or finance, and maybe it would be better off if they didn't bother. Two, if Bitcoin gets banned, too many networks are already formed around Bitcoin. They're not going to go away or give up on their favorite cryptocurrency. So security and cryptography experts will be incentivized to develop alternatives and for more security and anonymity features, which is exactly what I want. I don't know about you. And number three, it makes the tax implications a whole lot easier. You just get to keep your coins. Will Pangman. Yeah, I agree in completely with Derek. I love seeing these idiots <laughs> expose their chicanery and, you know, their charlatan behavior. Um, this, just, this just shows the world more and more how ridiculous the political system is in general, how ridiculous the, you know, the two-party system is here that we have in, uh, in the West predominantly, and it's... It's going to show more and more people who don't spend much time looking at politics or Bitcoin for that matter, just how um, ultimately meaningless this whole social organization structure that we find ourselves in is. Then there are better ways. You know, there's a senator who wants to ban NF gay NFL players and things like this. I mean, please keep putting yourselves out there and making a fool of yourself. Um, you know, I'd like to see a bipartisan effort against Bitcoin uh, because I don't think it will get very far, first of all. And second of all, um, if, you know, right now, if you have most of these issues that we have in society, they're uh, socially divisive or it's a left-right thing. But, um, you know, Bitcoin's apolitical and it's, it's neutral. Its nature is neutral. So if you could have both of these parties or at least the, le the most under-informed uh, least understanding of the technology members of, the, of both of these parties coming and attacking this thing with, you know, just their flailing attempts, um, more and more people will see how, how ridiculous the game of politics in general is, and it'll cause them to look clo more closely at Bitcoin when they see all kinds of legitimate businesses, their favorite tavern, their favorite dry cleaner, their whatever, accepting Bitcoin, and not wanting to see them you know, suffer for, uh, you know, the advantage that that gives them in their local marketplace or whatever, um, they'll come around and they'll be supportive of their friends, family, and their favorite businesses, uh, their favorite startups, um, and, and the conveniences that are inherent in all of these innovations. So, yeah, come at us. Come at me, bro. We're also joined by Jason King from Sean's Outpost. Jason, can you hear us? Not sure. Are you muted? Try to unmute yourself, perhaps. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Thoughts on yeah. the senator? Yeah. Um. I actually I love it. Um. I love when they do these um, really obvious ploys uh, that just sort of expose the machinery going on um, behind the curtain. You know, uh, the senator's one of his main campaign contributors is J.P. Morgan Chase who's also been sort of at the forefront of harassing Bitcoin-based businesses and cryptocurrency-based businesses. So to, to be able to have such a, you know, a blatant connect the dots between those two sources of a bank that obviously feels threatened by Bitcoin and then the senator that's in the pocket of that bank coming out very overtly and saying, no, Bitcoin's bad, I think that's fantastic. And I think that the more they do that sort of stuff and the American people can, you know, in the world can, can just see what a circus our political system is, I think that's actually ultimately good for all of us, just to be able to see the inner workings of all of that. Absolutely. Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, Joe Manchin is a uh, perfect proof of the Peter principle that in uh, large hierarchical organizations, people will rise until they achieve a position that far exceeds their own level of competence. Uh, <laughs> this is probably true for the entire Senate and Congress. In fact, uh, Joe Manchin's comments didn't even make it into the top ten most stupid comments made this week. Uh, another <laughs> member of Congress actually said the women who have abortions are asking to be raped. So, you know, Joe, you have to really try harder. You're surrounded by imbeciles. You really have to try harder. <laughs> now, let's see about banning. What happens 
if people try to ban Bitcoin, first of all, in this country we have due process, and due process is the ability to fight idiotic things like this in the court if you have enough money to do it. Uh, guess what? There are venture capitalists who have billions of dollars under management who have invested in Bitcoin companies, and they can hire a thousand lawyers an hour for the next year to take you all the way to the Supreme Court, and then you will face an interesting choice. Your Supreme Court just passed Citizens United less than two years ago that said that money is political speech. You have a very good chance of losing that fight, and if you lose it, it becomes legal precedent. That is not a fight you want to pick. It was probably better if you left it as a gray area. Uh, secondly, if you try to ban Bitcoin, you're going to find out the lesson that the recording industry learned with Napster. That Napster was probably the most benign and easy to work with organization that they had, and trying to ban it gave them BitTorrent. If you try to ban Bitcoin, you will discover that Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is the most open, transparent, and benign version of a cryptocurrency we have, and the reason for that is because you haven't tried to ban it. And if you do, you will discover the evolutionary imp impetus and pressure will create a thousand altcoins, each of which will be stealthier and more, uh, uh, more uh, anonymous and uh, more evasive. And these crypto coins will be venomous for the regulatory system. So what happens when you stomp on the little gecko is that it evolves to become a Komodo dragon, and the next time you try to stomp on it, it chews off your foot. Exit question. Which state will ban Bitcoin first? West Virginia, New York, Florida, Davi Barker. Oh, you put New York and Florida. That's tough. I'm going to go with New York. I think New York will ban it first. Chris J. I just hope it's not Hawaii because I'm still loving those brochures. It's a running Jason gag, don't worry. Um, I I'd say it's probably Florida, uh, which is going to make things interesting for me. Um, but, uh, you know. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Christoph Atlas. I don't think any of the states have the wherewithal or the balls to try and ban Bitcoin by themselves, and I'm persuaded by Andreas's argument that uh, a, a federal ban would be very sticky. I think uh, regulators are actually... Um, the people that actually make the decisions are much more clever than uh, people like this, you know, the senator mentioned. Um, I think that they they realize that a ban's not going to work. What they're just going to do is they're just going to make it as much of a pain in the ass as possible, introduce as much uncertainty and as much a cost to businesses that want to use Bitcoin as possible. And it's going to be the uh, you know, and rather than trying to cut off your head, they'll just drown you in molasses. So I think we'll see something more uh, along those lines. Megan Lords. Yeah, New York and Florida at the same time. That that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I was reading this article about New York wanting to ban uh, things like bottomless brunch, where you have uh, you know five dollars for unlimited amounts of alcohol, like petty stuff like that. But I think Florida is pretty big on banning uh, other things that are <laughs> that are important too. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna have to go with Florida. Derek J. Yeah, I don't think anyone's going to actually ban Bitcoin. Uh, they they realize that that would create more problems for themselves. But if it were anyone from the options you listed, it would obviously be New York, where you can't have trans fats, too much salt, or a big gulp. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'm I'm going to jump out there and say Illinois. Um, you know, Chicago has one of the most oppressive, uh, as a city state at least, has some of the most oppressive um, regulatory structures out there. Just incredibly high predatory tra tax environment. Um, if it would be anything, I think it would be Illinois. There's there's plenty of reason. There's plenty of competitors uh, that are threatened by Bitcoin in Illinois that operate both on and off the books. Although Bank of America is based there, and they've been relative. Their executives, at least, have been relatively positive or friendly um, toward the notion of Bitcoin. Let's see, muting working. Moving on, issue three: Bitcoin community update. The mad hey, Bitcoin hey, Twitter second. community <laughs> is united in its support for Chris Ellis and the Bitcoin Foundation board. Chris is an excellent and thoughtful speaker, as I'm sure you've all seen from his appearances here on the Bitcoin Group and Mad Bitcoins Live and the brand new World Crypto Network. 
Subscribe today at worldcryptonetwork.com. It's also been rumored that Bitcoin Magazine is planning a special Bitcoin media issue featuring the Bitcoin Group, Mad Bitcoins, and Let's Talk Bitcoin. Additionally, we've got an update on Bitcoin across America, where Jason King from Sean's Outpost is running across America to raise awareness for homelessness and how to stop it with Bitcoin. Learn more and donate at BitcoinAcrossAmerica.com. Jason is now in Louisiana, viewing the still remaining wreckage of boats from Hurricane Katrina. What is the most exciting event in the Bitcoin community right now? The possibility of electing one of its own to the Bitcoin Foundation? The emerging Bitcoin media, including the World Crypto Network? Or the continued success of Sean's Outpost and other Bitcoin charities? In which way is Bitcoin changing the world best? I ask you, Chris Ellis. Um, yeah, so the thing is, right, like anyone who wants power shouldn't be allowed it. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of these, um, you know, well, I don't know, because I've, ne I've never met John Matonis, and, and I'd love to. Um, but the thing is, it, it's important that you just have as much impact as you can on a relatively small area. That was why I joined the Feathercoin group, because they were a UK-based, you know, set of developers, and I could actually, you know, relate to. And they weren't trying to take over the world. It was just like, let's try and set up a local currency that has global potential. Uh, let's see what we can do with this technology and try to have as much impact. And we had SMS wallets that we set up um, that we're still trying to roll out to the homeless in London. Uh, we're going up to Hull next week, Hull City Council, which is a, a very deprived area of the UK because they want to, to know whether they should adopt either adopt Feathercoin or, or we can help them set up their own cryptocurrency. So really, we just saw it as a learning experience. And that was, is how I would continue. Um, in terms of running for it, I'd love to do it, even if it's just as a protest thing, you know, even if it's just to show that um, these kinds of organizations um, tend not to select alternative voices. And then maybe they can prove me wrong on that, you know. But yeah, I'm all, I'm all for it. I was very, very flattered by the support as well. We have a special guest, Jason King from Sean's Outpost. How's it going out there on the road, Jason? Uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, it's uh, it's been ridiculously cold lately. This polar vortex is complete BS, and I'm really unhappy with it. Um, but uh, it's been great. Been meeting really cool people and uh, and running with this crazy bus uh, and getting all kinds of questions. People wanting to know what the hell Bitcoin's about, and it's fun to be able to talk to people about Bitcoin all the time. Are you still in Louisiana? I am. I'm um, I'm about 40 miles outside of Baton Rouge. Um, and so I hope to make it out of Louisiana uh, this weekend. Excellent. And how's the outreach going? Are people understanding your your message of bitcoins and stopping homelessness? Um, I, I, some people <laughs> get it. Um, you know, when I started helping the homeless, I had no idea what sort of pushback we were going to get. That how many how many people uh, in our in, you know entrenched government um, have direct opposition to helping the homeless because it, it, you know, it pokes holes in this concept that the government is there to take care of you because if you show how poorly that they actually do of, of taking care of the people that they're supposed to, um, that, you know, that's once again pulling back the curtain and, you know, we get outright attacked. Um, the mayor of Pensacola actually called Sean's Outpost an extremist organization to Al Jazeera um, yesterday, which was just hilarious because our, our extremist is that we go give people sack lunches that are starving. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, Al Jazeera deal, deals with some extremist stuff, and I, there were correspondents from the Middle East. I think that, you know, I think they probably take issue with, with calling people feeding the homeless extremists, but that, that is what we go up against. But I think, um, you know, it's not just Sean's outpost. I think that cryptocurrency has this, is going to, enable so many things in terms of charities and nonprofits that just haven't been uh, possible before. If you think about um, if you think about just the difference between the profit and the nonprofit sector, it's really sort of a broken dynamic there is that um, so something that we don't have in the nonprofit space is we don't have the ability to, to generate risk capital and you know you need, you need the ability to raise funds and to be able to take risks if you're actually going to you know iterate 
on solving a real problem. And so, like, if I wanted to make the next Angry Birds and said I wanted to raise $25 million for it, no one would have any problem with that. And then if I, if I made money on it and wanted to return money to my investors, um, no one would have any problem with that. But if I said, hey, I want to end homelessness in America and I need to raise $25 million for it, and if you invest in that and we can find a way to generate the capital to return investment to you, people would actually demonize me for it because, you know, you can't have people making money on saving the world, you know. You can make money on, you know, video games or selling, you know, drugs as a pharmaceutical company or whatever, but if you actually want to do the steps that we applaud in the corporate world and you want to do apply those principles towards the nonprofit sector, people get really, really squirrely about that. Um, so, like, with cryptocurrency, we would have the ability to actually, you know, as Andreas loves to say, it's programmable money. We could actually program it where, like, if we did a fundraiser to to raise capital to actually, you know, to build a marketing team to actually raise more funds, and then that marketing team raised lots more than our initial investment, where we could program it to when the money came in, our investors that helped us get the investment to get more investment actually got a return on their investment. What's wrong with that? Um, and so I think that, I think we're going to see a lot of that kind of stuff coming up in the next couple of years. And I think that it's going to be really an exciting time where we can start taking everything that we've learned from startup culture in terms of you know uh, iterative design and failing fast um, and actually being results oriented instead of process oriented. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot of that start leaking into the nonprofit and charity sector, and I think that's going to be a really exciting place to be. I think that's a great point that startup culture really will transform charity as well as the ability to accept bitcoins online from anywhere in the world to start up your donations to get things going. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a, a fairly small organization in this, you know, small backwater in Florida, but we we get donations from, you know, over 40 countries that, you know, just think that it's wrong that it's illegal to be homeless in this you know, area, and so they're willing to come to our aid with their treasure, and they can do that, you know, in an instant, frictionlessly, uh, for damn near free, and that's uh, that's pretty close to a miracle, you know? Uh, Bitcoin's amazing, and it's going to change everything. Absolutely, and viewers watching now can donate at bitcoinacrossamerica.com and also at Sean's Outpost. Correct. Moving on, Christoph Atlas. Which one of these uh, three things do you think is most important for changing the world with Bitcoin? I think that um, the the donation stuff has kind of the the biggest impact. Um, you know, I, I hate to even form an opinion uh, talking next to, to uh, Sean who or Jason from uh, from that charity because I you know I know he has a ton of experience but um, just a couple of thoughts I think that um, social welfare is much more efficiently handled by the private sector uh, in sure. charities eventually they're going to displace the government welfare systems uh, especially as the systems run out of money and they're revealed for being uh, terribly inefficient and corrupt and uh, Jason was sort of talking about how uh, charities in the future will have more and more room to innovate. And what really excites me about that is eventually they're going to be able to do totally new things that are not really being done uh, on a large scale yet. Uh, things like preventing um, disease and preventing uh, social issues in our society uh, rather than just trying to constantly uh, play whack-a-mole with the symptoms. And I think that is going to have a massively revolutionary effect on our society when we start really, um, you know, stop wasting money on ineffective uh, government social welfare systems and start having organizations that will profit by the health of human beings. Megan Lords. Well, with Bitcoin, the moon is the limit, so I'm really excited to see all of the different things that are coming out of this community, and of course I'm biased, I, you know, <laughs> I'm part of Sean's Outpost and Bitcoin Not Bombs, and I'm very excited to be a part of anything that they're involved in. It's very hard to argue with, you know, over 30,000 meals being delivered to the homeless, uh, you know, over less than a year's time, and all of these other things that are happening uh, in Pensacola, it's very exciting, uh, but I'm also excited with what we're going to be doing with Bitcoin 
point out bombs, and sorry, Davi, if I'm stealing your thunder or whatever, <laughs> but uh, we have uh, translated some quick start guides into Spanish uh, that we want to get distributed uh, over the border to Mexico and eventually have plans to uh, translate them into other languages and get them distributed worldwide and really break down the borders uh, between nations because that's what it's about for me is, you know, Bitcoin is for everyone. It's for the entire world and I'm very excited to see all of these, uh, all of this potential for world aid. I, uh, you know, like Jason said, government welfare obviously isn't helping people, it's causing people to fall through the cracks. And then when you have the warfare state on top of that, purposefully creating poverty in other parts of the world, uh, Bitcoin is able to circumvent all of that and undo a lot of it too. Um, and it, it's awesome. I, I'm very, very excited for the future. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to see so many innovations coming out of this that I, it is hard to pick a favorite. It, it really is. So uh, I'm very excited for the future. Derek, Jay. <clears throat> the most exciting thing happening in the Bitcoin space right now is the flood of Bitcoin charities, like Free Aid and Sean's Outpost and a host of others. Uh, what they're doing is changing people's lives today. You know, I'm re really excited about the technological leaps that are going to improve all our lives in the future, but putting a roof over people's heads and giving them a pillow on which to lay their heads and giving them food to eat. I mean, uh, Sean's Outpost has served over 50,000 meals. Well, the mayor of Pensacola may be calling them extremists, but what they're doing is changing the world. And in the Ukraine, I can even share a, a picture with you that in the Ukraine, the protesters are using Bitcoin to finance their resistance to the government. Uh, this is a fast way to raise funds that was never possible before. And I think the ability to raise money to fund these revolutionary projects is changing the world in some really cool ways. Will Pangman. I love the Ukraine story and you know the the kid at whatever college I forgot but uh, who held hold up the sign on, on ESPN and got twenty four thousand dollars just shows the immense power um, and I'm so glad he did that it was a great proof of concept to show how this is this can be possible for um, you know activism around the world and and the people of, of Ukraine are, are showing that too so hopefully they're getting the support that they need to carry on their activities um, I wanted to go off script and mention some of the community projects that I'm really um, passionate about and excited about uh, and I'm, I'm working on with just so many people are education related so um, I've been in touch with lots of community, uh, lots of um, community meetup groups, and and trying to pull all them together, connect them to each other. Um, you know, all all of them connect to one another. You know, whenever they can see that help. Also, university, uh, you know, student organizations. There's a bunch I've been in touch with lately, and and getting them to connect with one another, and providing them some needed resources to do outreach on their campuses and. Um, there's a project in the works, hopefully, where some resources can come together to make that a much more organized effort, um, not only just for the student organizations, but for the faculties of these various universities, providing them the adequate um, you know, instructional material that they need to possibly include uh, Bitcoin material or issues into their, into their class curriculum. Uh, for, for different disciplines, not just computer science, mathematics, cryptography, software development, but humanities, um, you know, history, economics, sociology, and so on. Um, so that's, that's something I'm really excited about. Pulling, there's so many great community projects going on. I'm really excited for Christoph's book. I'm really excited um, for Bitcoin Bigfoot. They're going to basically parachute drop supplies to meetups around the country who request them, and they're going to do it at you know, for free. Uh, people are working on pulling in sponsorships for that project so that they can print 100,000 informational brochures, um, similar to the one Bitcoin Nut Bombs is publishing and distributing as well. And, and there's so many community projects. Um, I'm kind of making it my job to network with all of them and network them to each other, introduce them to each other, and build, um, build the human network around Bitcoin so that the education can get out there and we can reach a critical mass of adoption well before any effective um, 
efforts for banning Bitcoin or any kind of like stifling regulation can come down and have any noticeable um, appeal or effect. So that's that's the that's the importance I see, and we're doing that here with this show, and media is another part of that. So the the other thing I'm really excited to see is all of the media outlets. You know, we had such a you know, we have such high quality media production going on in Bitcoin. There's so many. Um, Thomas, the work you're doing, the new World Crypto Network is very exciting, and there's going to be lots of great content coming out there. Let's talk Bitcoin for a long time has been producing A plus quality stuff, and podcasts like Derek's and Free Talk Live and so many others out there um, are really paving the way and actually getting information out to the ears that have never heard this stuff before in a, in a forum that they are accepting of and, and ready to listen to, um, not CNN you know, saying Bitcoin is crashing and going down because the largest exchange shut down and it's a 30 second little report that leaves a viewer with no knowledge whatsoever of Bitcoin the the impression that it was a nice little toy experiment and it's over and gone so we know that's not true and more and more people that get introduced to it from all of these community efforts I just mentioned every single one of them um, aren't going to have that notion seep in it's it, you know we're we're fighting a winning battle here and it's super exciting Andreas Antonopoulos. What we're seeing is the development of currency as a community of common purpose. When currency is not a mandatory thing imposed from above, but instead is a free choice, you associate with a currency that exp ex expresses your principles and it allows you to express those principles through action. And guess what we're not buying with Bitcoin? We're not buying bombs, we're not buying drones, we're not buying attack helicopters, we're not buying patronage, we're not buying bribes, we're not buying cozy relationships with regulators, we're not buying politicians. We're buying charitable donations, we're giving, we're tipping, we're donating, we're creating education, we're creating charity. Those are the voluntary actions of a community of common purpose that has arisen around this currency. And that community is generationally defined, it's full of young people who are tired of the old ways. And that is absolutely unstoppable. Davi Barker. When we talk about these things, I think it's very easy to imagine that what we're saying is that there's this new technology and that this new technology is a useful tool in these areas that we're concerned about. But I actually think that it's much deeper than that. And in fact, the existence of a free market currency, of a decentralized cryptocurrency, actually gets at the root of the problems that we're talking about in the first place. So Bitcoin is not just a solution laid over top of these problems. It's actually addressing the monster that caused these problems. When the Federal Reserve Act was proposed in 1913, the slogan of the day was, break the grip of the money trust. Congress came out and told the people, this bill will break the grip of the money trust. And what they didn't tell them was that the bill was written by the money trust. And since then, the money trust has controlled who gets houses through home loans, who gets cars through car loans, who gets education through school loans. The money trust has gotten in bed with the military industrial complex. It has bought and paid for most of the politicians in this country. And so we're actually saying there's a systemic problem and it's caused these problems of poverty and it's caused these problems in, in society and we're going to address those too. But fundamentally we're striking the root. We're breaking the grip of the money trust. Absolutely. Exit question. One month from now which one of these issues will we still be talking about? Chris, Jay. Yeah, I think I probably the um, the Sean's outpost. That was actually one of my favorite of all the, the Bitcoin um, uh, phenomena that's emerged since, since the beginning because charitable giving is the most popular use case. It still is. And so what's interesting about this whole industry is that it brings together both honest and dishonest intentions and just puts them side by side, you know, in stark contrast to one another. Uh, Jason King. Um, I, yeah, I think it's probably going to be, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency-based charities um, in a month, and a year, and ten years from now, because I think that we're going to be changing the whole game. Um, uh, I'm really excited to see what, what we have come from this, because 
we do have a community that is committed to solving these huge problems that we have, and I think that you know we are showing the world that we are a compassionate group of people um, that that's not going to believe in the lies that we were told that we were growing up on, and that we are going to rebuild things correctly from the ground up. Um, and I think that that's going to be a really interesting time. And I think because it's interesting, we'll still be talking about it. Christoph Atlas. Well, obviously, uh, we on the book Bitcoin group are going to be talking about the new crypto media, um, and I think that's going to be a big thing uh, moving forward. Um, you know, these days, if I want to learn something about the new crypto economy, which is obviously the future, um, I go to individuals or very small organizations, and when I read uh, something that's that's any worthwhile in a website like the New York Times or um, you know the LA Post or whatever, um, it's shocking. And most of the time, I just find out that it's you know someone uh, freelancing that already writes for CoinDesk. Um, so I think that's here to stay. Megan Lords. I'm going to be talking about the charity aspect of it, even if that part somehow ceases to exist in the future, which I don't think it will. In fact, I think we're only going to see more people being helped. We've already seen thousands of people helped by these Bitcoin charities, and it's only been around five years. Imagine when we start seeing larger populations uh, working with this currency and solving these problems. Uh, I mean. We're gonna we're going to see thousands of lives, millions of lives changed uh, through Bitcoin charities. Uh, so I I don't think that's ever gonna go away, and I'll never stop talking about it. Derek J. <clears throat> well, one month from now, we'll still be talking about cryptocurrency based charities. This is the beginning of a new era of volunteerism, and Bitcoin has made it possible by changing the way people do charity. But it also means uh, changing the way people engage with media. As Kristoff said, you know, gone are the days when people will tune in to the mainstream channels for their news about decentralized currencies. Instead, it's much more likely that they'll increasingly be turning to the Internet and alternative media for this kind of information. Will Pangman. Yeah, we'll be talking about Bitcoin nonprofits and charitable giving and the volume of, of those kinds of transactions in the space. We'll be talking a lot more, I think, about education, uh, grassroots education, and um, the injection of Bitcoin into formal, if you will, education in, at the you know, uh, post-secondary level, uh, university level. And I'm excited to, to see that happen and, and the sea change that that will cause. We will see um, more excitement and a more positive tone on the reporting of such things. And more and more folks will come around and see that this is not about, uh, you know, buying illicit goods online, child trafficking, you know, terrorism, whatever, all the dirty words they want to paint all over this thing. Those things aren't sticking. I'm really grateful to see that. That was my one major concern about Bitcoin when I first... Um, found out about it and first fell in love with it over a year ago was that the reputation of it could be sullied um, and that the public is so used to being duped by such uh, strategies that they would fall for it again. But Bitcoin seems to be impervious to these kinds of things. It's so resilient and that's, that's encouraging. So education and of course charitable giving. Andreas Antonopoulos. We're going to be talking about charity because Jason's going to still be running. Run, Jason, run. Davi Barker. I can tell you what Bitcoin Not Bombs is going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about borders and how it's sort of an obsolete concept. And we're going to be attempting to demonstrate that in the coming months. Excellent. Moving on. Mount More Mount Gox. According to Coindesk, Mt. Gox has never conducted a single audit of its customer deposits, and Carpellis may have been the only one who knew how to tap the company's cold storage. The article calls him the Wizard of Oz, the one moving all the levers, pulling all the switches, the man behind the curtain. If this is true, and it apparently is, could it really come down to just one man? How can we prevent this from happening again in the future? How could it have happened in the past? Jason King. Let's see, are you unmuted? Try unmuting it. No, not gonna work. Is that better? 
That's good. Sorry. Hello? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think it's crazy, but I think I think what Mountain Gox failing um, shows is is that you're going to fail in this ecosystem. Is that there's not going to be anybody that's going to step in and protect you, and if they're going to use these outmoded concepts that are are worthless in, in our new economy, that we're going to weed you out. You know that that the market and the blockchain are going to weed you out. This is not going to you're not going to be able to do this. If you look at it, yeah, in Bitcoin years, Mount Gox has been around forever, but um. But it's been this short period of time, and you know they did this huge, basically scam to everybody, and you know they got shut down. You know if this would have been J.P. Morgan Chase, this would have gone on for 20 years. They would have gotten two or three bailouts. They would have gotten some congressional stipends or something to stay open, um, and you know we had this huge wrecking ball that's really been bouncing around the Bitcoin community for years now, and just doing damage. It's like you know. It became a uh, you know just a risk that you put into the cost of doing business. Okay, well you know Gox is going to screw up in three months, so we just need to take that into account now with whatever that we're doing. Um, and then so I think we've been routing around this for a long time, and to see it finally sort of come to an end, um, I think is good. And um, and I think that uh, the fact that Mark was the only person that possibly had access to the cold storage. Uh, I, don't, I think that that's a problem you're never going to see again because, um, you know, people have been putting out all of these ways that you can prove that that's not the case. And I think that from now on, everyone's going to expect those things to be implemented. And I think for the most part, I think everyone or most people already expected more than Mount Gox. I think that Mount Gox was sort of grandfathered in and people were using it because they had been using it, but I think that most people for their day-to-day -day transactions and bitcoins did, were already not relying on Mount Gox, you know? They were at Bitstamp or Coinbase or they were they had figured something else out. You know, I think that's one of those things where it's like People talk about in Columbus's day that like everyone thought the world was flat. Well, that's crap. Like everyone, knew, most people knew that the Earth was round. There was just some you know pedagogical people that were saying that it was the Earth was flat, and that's what they put out in the media. But like co common sense was already there that the Earth was round, and we didn't need anyone to tell you you know tell us that. And I feel like it's the same way with Cox. I feel like. Everyone already knew something bad was going on there, and yeah, there's there's definitely some damage, and I do feel really bad for anyone that lost money on Gox. You know, I have friends that lost a lot of money there. I think Eric Voorhees came out and said he lost 550 coins out of just like laziness, basically, of you know, because it was just it was easy to keep it on there, and so that stuff sucks. But it's also it's it's kind of this breath of fresh air. That it's done now. We're never going to have any more of these times where Gox is just going to get to come in every couple of months and you know bang down on the market. Um, that that part of of the Bitcoin history is kind of coming to a close. And I think what we're actually going to see is after the flash crash with the Silk Road, you know, people had said for years that the Silk Road was what was propping up Bitcoin, and when it crashed. I went on record. I was like, I think we're about to see a huge takeoff because people are going to realize the resiliency of this currency and the re resiliency of this community, and that's going to translate into the price going up. And I think we're probably going to start seeing something like that too, with the quote unquote, you know, largest Bitcoin exchange takes a crap and the price barely goes down. I think people are going to be like, wow, after all of the, you know, panic. BS news dies down. People are going to be like, "Wow, Bitcoin's still here. It's still valuable. Maybe I should get involved in this." I think it's. I think it's going to be great, and I think it's a good sign of things to come. Absolutely, Christoph Atlas. Well, I think that um, I don't know if Gox was so much removed from the ecosystem as they they removed themselves. I think that especially some of the the old people in the community, you know, old relative to Bitcoin, of course, they could have done a better job. For those that have voiced a, a any kind of vote of confidence for Mark Capelli's over the last year, uh, maybe they owe us a, a sort of an apology for that. Um, but keep in mind that we are still a legacy banking society. That's where we're coming out of, and even the people that are the most seasoned with Bitcoin have lived the vast majority of their lives in that type of system. So I, I'm not going to blame them heavily for still, um, you know, having a... 
allowing themselves to have the kind of thought that's like, well, Mark is a good guy, so um, you know, you know, if he says that he's doing things well, then that's good enough for me. When in fact we should be, you know, proving those things cryptographically in a decentralized manner, looking for decentralized uh, solutions to these issues. Um, that's that's the way of doing. That's the Bitcoin way of, of doing things. And uh, so, you know, it's something that we will adopt uh, in the in the near future. I think Andreas is pushing for exactly the the right kind of reforms in this area: a third party audits, um, real time auditing cryptographic proof of reserves, all that stuff. The only thing that I would throw in there as well is I'd love to see exchanges working with their competitors to form uh, open transactions-based voting pools. Uh, that would help deal with the, the threat of insider uh, theft. And this could obviously be extended to the black market exchanges as well. There's been a lot of uh, insider theft or just you know getting hacked and so forth and having uh, stuff stolen. Um, these are all decentralized solutions for protecting consumers. It's something that um, you know we're realizing now that we absolutely need to have in place. And the great thing about these solutions is they actually solve the problem. They actually uh, help solve the weaknesses in the market. Whereas when you introduce government regulation, it's like a doctor uh, promising to remove a tumor with a broadsword. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the next phase of, of the, big, the Bitcoin ecosystem. Megan Lords. If it's true that Mark only had access to this wallet, then it's an excellent argument against centralization because it doesn't get more centralized than one guy having control over everything. Um, so I think this is really proving the point um, of decentralization and that that is a much more efficient way of, of dealing uh, with these problems. And I think uh, we're going to be pushed even more in that direction. And I think it's also going to, especially... Uh, how, how this situation gets dealt with, I, which, of course, it's extremely complicated, but I think it's also going to be eye-opening for people who are on the outside looking in, and they're not quite sure what to think about Bitcoin and, you know, how, how, how to feel about the community. I, I think the way uh, the community deals with this through decentralization will be a great example for them to look to and kind of uh, inspire trust in that. And then, I mean, it's probably overly optimistic to think that it would be nice to see a kind of mind shift uh, with with the mindset being applied to uh, you know centralized control and governance. Derek J. <clears throat> Unlike at Mount Gox, in the future it won't come down to one man. It will come down to zero men, or rather one code, because it's going to be decentralized and autonomous. The world is trending more towards empowering the individual, and we want to know more about what the, in, uh, the organizations that we interact with, we want to know what they're doing. Are they solvent? Can we see the books? Can we have a webcam into the office? I mean, who knows what customers will demand from exchanges in the future, but what we do know is that the customers will know more about their money than was ever possible before. And one thing I learned from the Mt. Gox fiasco that I never realized before is how quickly an economy can survive or how quickly it can rebound um, after a large financial institution goes out of business. I mean, in my lifetime, it's always been too big to fail institutions get a bailout or get put on life support. And I, I wonder if the large banks were allowed to fail if the economy in the U.S. would be recovering now. It's nice to see that companies can fail and economies go on and actually might even improve quicker than otherwise. Will Pangman. Yeah, just to pick up where Derek left off, you know, you, you cut out these tumors or they cut themselves out, you know, all of the, the, the cancerous cells die off and um, the healthy tissues around it can rebound and regrow and and innovate and expand and so that's you know that's it to a T you know one man has control of this stuff you know speculating here perhaps but you've got uh, you've got the first goxing or the first few goxings and they're you know struggling they have to go on a fractional reserve just to try and keep business going and keep confidence up and um, yeah I know there's a better term for that but for the sake of argument um, just putting that out there so he has to have control of it so that there can't be any major thefts or hacks or, or, or something like that and, and keep the thing going. But if all they're doing is worrying about trying to catch up in the race again and become fully solvent and have a full reserve again, 
They're not innovating. And that's what we saw. They never updated their website um, meaningfully. You know, there was, they, they were still running it on PHP. It's, it's still, uh, I, I think there was a design update and that was it. No functionality, no extra features, nothing really to speak of um, for innovation. So think of it this way, like the other, like Christoph and Derek pointed out, if you have these cryptographic proof of reserves, um, other transparent practices put into place for exchanges or other financial institutions in cryptocurrency, you have just freed up an immense amount of man hours for innovation and I, I'll just leave it at that. Andreas Antonopoulos. I think the Gox fiasco points out a couple of lessons that we need to, uh, to learn. Now I'm a huge supporter of using algorithmic solutions uh, such as proof of solvency or proof of reserves. Uh, essentially using a hashing algorithm and homomorphic encryption to add up all of the account balances of all of the customers and be able to prove uh, to the world that you have the balance and to each customer that their balance was included in that total. Uh, that's a very simple way. It's, uh, it's a way that is uh, not subject to manipulation. Uh, beyond that, I would like to see uh, various other forms of automated algorithmic protections, including multi-sig uh, uh, with backup and escrow uh, capabilities and uh, things like that. However, uh, as much as I love those algorithmic solutions, I think it's also important to have independent audits. And the reason for that is that even those solutions need to be implemented by people. And uh, you will have code that will need to be implemented by people, which should be open source and should be reviewed by lots of other people. But the, the basic practice of doing independent audits is a good practice. It's a practice that forces you to, uh, to be subject to external scrutiny, uh, scrutiny that will put you into a position where you adopt good operational practices uh, because you know you're going to be tested. It also build, uh, brings a fresh perspective to your operations. Uh, it's very easy when you're in an environment to lose focus and not see things that to outsiders um, are obvious. Uh, peer review is the gold standard for the scientific process and independent audit is also the gold standard We appear to have lost Andreas. Davi Barker. Can you repeat the question? I believe the question was how could Mt. Gox have been run by a single person? Does this surprise you? No, um, because Mt. Gox came from such humble beginnings. It, it didn't, I mean, you have to understand too, Bitcoin has exploded beyond most people's wildest dreams. If you were in on it early and, and you were looking at it when it was crossing the penny or crossing the dollar, where it is now is, is unbelievable. And Mt. Gox was the exchange when it was that small. I mean, it was the exchange when one person could operate an exchange, and it grew faster than he could manage. And it's understandable that the market wouldn't tolerate a single exchange. Uh, but no, it doesn't surprise me that it had one one founding member who wouldn't let go. I mean, that's the story of uh, of uh, that's that's hubris in a nutshell, isn't it? <laughs> there could be only one. Andreas, you're reconnected. Do you have more to add? Yes, I'm sorry about that. Well, um, you know, independent audit, as I was saying, is the gold standard of security. It allows us to bring a fresh perspective. So I'd like to see two things. The first is collaboration between CSOs, uh, between the security professionals who are on the front lines of operating large infrastructure within Bitcoin, because there will be threats. Even if those threats are not existential, even if these threats are not systemic, even if these threats do not affect the Bitcoin protocol, we will see denial of service attacks, we will see malware, we will see exploits, and we need to share information on those things. And then we need to audit each other. And in the audit process, we will learn from each other and we will learn better practices. If, if we can apply best practices, then we can avoid what Carpellis was doing at Gox, which was the very definition of worst practices security, and he took it to a whole new level. Thank you. Chris, Jay. So this is the picture of the week, right? This is, this is the humility 
that is that is required and the honor. And if anyone is watching this um, who speaks Japanese, I'd really like you to tell me. There's a word in Japanese that I used to know. A friend of mine at school used to tell me. It means something like doing the right thing, even if you really, 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 really don't want to do it, but you do it because it's the right thing to do. And I, you know. He got comfortable, and I think the thing is, it's very hard when you start from humble beginnings to remember those beginnings and to stay humble as you grow older. I don't know what happened any more than anyone else does. I think only this man knows what happened, and the questions that we're asking now is who knew what and when. Um, I think that we should leave it to the professionals or, or any of the the sort of the amateur um, auditors that we've seen come out. Amateur, as in you know, they love doing it. Um, I think those should should. Uh, those people should be the ones to do it. He needs to stop telling people that he might be able to get these coins back because the, the customers, the victims that lost their money need closure. Um, he, he continues to say that he might be able to get uh, the money back and I, I don't think that he should be he should be saying that. So I'm not surprised that it happens. You know, these things happen all the time. Um, but I'd echo all the things that, that, you know, the other guys have said about the, the full reserves and so on. Moving on. Issue 5. The TSA wants to count my bitcoins. Davi Barker, Bitcoin Not Bombs campaign navigator and regular panelist here on the Bitcoin Group, was recently harassed by the TSA while traveling home from the Liberty Forum when the TSA saw his bitcoin and wanted to count it. Davi, what was this experience like? It was... It was kind of frightening, to tell you the truth. In the moment, it was frightening, and then as soon as it was all over, it became hilarious very quickly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he said that he saw Bitcoin in my back. <laughs> Did you have any uh, Bitcoin pins or plastic toy coins, any casatious coins? No, I think that's what he was looking for, because when I asked him what he thought Bitcoin looked like, he said medallions or tokens. Uh, and I did have about 500 lapel pins in my backpack, but none of them were Bitcoin lapel pins because I sold out of Bitcoin lapel pins. But certainly so, other lapel pins must be interchangeable with Bitcoin lapel pins and work on the similar system, right? Well, no, they were alt pins. <laughs> alt but, pins. Uh, what, I, what I had was I had uh, my Bitcoin Not Bombs hoodie on, and so he saw the B and he saw a bunch of metal and he thought casacious coins i got to give this guy some trouble <laughs> did they ask to see your phone did they want your password no weren't interested in my laptop weren't interested in my phone weren't interested in my usb drive they were interested in the stockpile of metal that i had these are highly technical tsa agents perhaps they were only interested in paper wallets or physical bitcoins well I'm that's an interesting fine. thing if they are going to be looking for Bitcoin embedded in objects, they're going to have to scrutinize every single object individually because it can be written anywhere. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you what I think happened. Um, so you know, a little while ago, FinCEN, you know, they sent their cease and desist to the Casatius guy. And around that same time, probably what happened was someone uh, at the, you know, the higher levels of the TSA wrote a memo to send out to all of their... Uh, their agencies to say, hey, look, be on the lookout for these casacious coins. They're a really convenient way for someone to uh, physically smuggle more than $10,000 across the border, which they're, of course, very sensitive about. And, of course, you know, the average person at the TSA is not exactly the, the tool is sharp in the shed, and so, you know, what they probably interpret that is, they, they don't know what the hell Bitcoin is, so they probably just say, oh, I guess Bitcoin is medallion shaped things and we need to be looking for those now um, so uh, I think that's probably what was going on for Davi. But Cassatius coins are not a convenient way to physically smuggle money across borders. Bitcoin is a convenient way to conveniently smuggle money across borders but I wouldn't take it through a TSA checkpoint. But you don't you don't need to physically smuggle bitcoins. Um, right. You can just send them over the internet. So well, if you were going to do it physically, the whole system, it could you could send all of your coins. bitcoins with one coin. It's one QR code that gets through, and suddenly thousands of bitcoins could be sent across. You don't need little a bag full of little medallions to get all your bitcoins through. I could also be carrying a thousand little medallions that are all empty. <laughs> They'd have to check each one to make sure that you weren't carrying any. Bitcoin. I mean, 
I have them here. I'm I'm lucky I wasn't carrying these because I've got all of these blank casacious coins, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that are worth their weight in aluminum. <laughs> well, you know how uh, the QR codes for um, passwords are now t tend to be uh, BIP thirty eight, uh, you know, encrypted. I wonder if we're gonna have to come up with a new BIP for uh, encrypting the actual. Uh, addresses so that some asshole doesn't scan in your QR code and start asking about the balance. It definitely could be an issue if you were wearing a t-shirt with your donation logo on it and they scanned your donation logo suddenly they know the value of your company or your charity or whatever it is. It's right there. Um, Davi, you said they left you alone after they figured it out that you were traveling in country. Does that mean that this kind of treatment is okay for international travel? No. I mean, they think so. I don't think their existence as an agency is okay. Should the government be allowed to count our bitcoins as we travel internationally, locally? Why not a counter at the mall that lets you find out if high-value bitcoin customers enter your store? So <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> It yeah, this be... is this is worrying on a number of different levels. I mean, for one thing, the TSA's uh, jurisdiction and mandate is to protect security. There is a narrow Fourth Amendment exception in the uh, airport that was established by the Supreme Court in order to check for for bombs, explosives, and other things that uh, threaten the security of of uh, airlines. Uh, there is no exception in the Fourth Amendment for the TSA specifically to be looking for monetary instruments when uh, when being uh, transferred abroad or looking for other forms of contraband. Uh, and what they've gradually done is they've gradually expanded that narrow exception uh, to make it ass essentially a blanket warrantless search environment uh, where they can refer it to law enforcement. There's also an important distinction here, which is that the TSA have no law enforcement powers. I, I believe, Davi, at some point... They said if you don't answer questions, they will refer you uh, to law enforcement who will take you into custody. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And I asked them, aren't you law enforcement? And they said, no, we're not. Yeah, they, they have no law enforcement mandate. Furthermore, uh, you're not actually obligated to answer any questions. Uh, even if there is an hour exception to the Fourth Amendment, there is absolutely no exception to your Fifth Amendment uh, right to remain silent at all times. They can refuse you entry into the airport and turn you back, uh, but they cannot force you to answer questions. And if law enforcement did arrive, the fact that you refuse to answer questions has nothing to do uh, with anything. It is not illegal and it is not a basis for arrest. It's not even a basis for a reasonable suspicion detention under the Terry Stop uh, uh, mandate uh, that the police have or the authority they have uh, for uh, under reasonable suspicion to stop you for a limited time uh, to detain you in order to uh, further interrogate you. At any time, you have the right to not answer any questions. So, in many cases, the appropriate answer to the TSA is, it's none of your fucking business. And when the police come and they say, what did you say to the TSA? You'll say, I said it's none of their fucking business. Um, am I free to go? Now, the other thing to remember is that under TSA rules, you have the right to videotape in a checkpoint. You have the right to photograph in a checkpoint. They will tell you that that is not allowed, but in fact you have a First Amendment right to photograph in an airport and videotape in an airport or any public space or space that is open to the public. You can video interactions with public officials. The TSA has guidelines on their site that say this very specifically, that you are allowed to videotape in a checkpoint as long as you're not pointing your camera directly at the screens of the checking equipment. Take your phone, Point it towards the TSA agent. Use the forward camera so they can see their own face on the screen being recorded with a little blinking light, and then continue the conversation. They behave much better if they've got a live streaming video of that interaction going out on the air. The TSA do not have law enforcement power. They do not have any more rights than anybody else, and you do not lose your rights just because you walked into an airport. So don't take that shit. I didn't. I As soon as I realized I was still talking to security, I immediately went into I don't answer questions mode. Um, and I was about ready to even ask for an attorney because they started threatening to arrest me. Um, but uh, the other problem with this is, is that they take all of your property when you go through these screenings. So at the moment that this happened, my recording device was deep inside the backpack that they wanted to search. 
And so right. I wasn't about to open the backpack and then say, you can't look in my backpack, if that makes sense. But in the future, absolutely. I'm going to be much more careful to have a recording device on my person. Right. I, I generally turn on a recording device as I hand over my ID and uh, boarding pass, and I keep it recording live throughout the entire interaction until I leave the screening area. Uh, cool. I always opt out, and I do a pat-down, and when I do a pat-down, I narrate the experience to the live video, making it very clear that it's being recorded as it occurs. Uh, generally speaking, I find that people are much more polite to me. Uh, they're also much more circumspect in their accusations, in their threats, uh, and in uh, behavior that can be used against them uh, when seen on video. Uh, they're also much faster to get a supervisor. Down. I put it down on the floor next to me, oh, that's next smart. to my foot, and as it's pointing upwards, you can not only see that it's recording, you can see in the, in the screen uh, what it's recording, because I use the forward camera so that it's obvious what it's recording. Um, I've had TSA agents many times object to this, where they look, they see the screen that's recording, and they go, you know, what the hell are you doing? And I said, you know, I say, sir, ma'am, there are 10,000 cameras pointed at me and one pointed at you. I'm sure you can handle it. I am exercising my yeah. First Amendment right. And that's how it goes, and they can't do anything about it. Andreas, could you describe for us what a narration of a uh, pat-down experience sounds like? Uh, yes, I, I, I say things like I've opted out and I'm now preparing for the uh, physical pat-down with uh, Agent uh, Lopez of the Transportation Security Administration. Uh, and then as they do their normal spiel, which they do much more carefully, uh, that's all recorded. But all, all you're doing is basically indicating that this is now being recorded uh, and, and that you're protecting yourself. Uh, and I do that uh, almost every time I go through a TSA uh, screening point. Can you walk me through where your phone goes from the x-ray machine to the pat-down? Because I put my phone into one of those gray bins. So how does it get from the gray bin to the pat-down? Because they don't let me return to my property. Oh, they pick up the property uh, and take it uh, with you. And, uh, yeah, usually. So, yes. Oh, no, they, they usually pick up the bins and say, which one is your property? And they, they take it uh, with you. And they'll and let so you touch it? Bin. They will let me touch my phone, yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, well, you just keep the phone recording while you put it on the x-ray machine, right? Absolutely. It goes through and records the entire time from the moment I enter the checkpoint until the moment I leave the checkpoint. And I've never had problems with this, but, you know, quite honestly, they might, uh, they might try to, to not let you take your phone, but they're going to bring your property near you. So just uh, speak, speak that, louder uh, for the microphone. The key point there is as long as you leave it recording, you're leaving some kind of evidence around. So if something happened, you'd at least have recording from the x-ray machine. Yeah, yeah. The, other, the other thing to do is whenever you go with uh, two people to the airport, if you're being escorted by someone else, what you do is you go through the security in two batches. First person goes through while the second person sits back and records the entire process from before the screening line. And then as soon as the one person is through, they start recording from the other end and the second person goes through. Uh, and that way you've got continuous recording from an independent witness throughout the entire process. And they notice. They absolutely notice this is happening. They might come and ask you questions. They might ask you why you're recording, et cetera, et cetera in which case you just refuse to answer questions and point them to the TSA policy. Uh, but it's very important that you assert your rights. Rights are like muscles. Unless you exercise them, they wither and die. And the TSA did not cancel the Constitution just because they put on a blue uniform. It's absolutely tragic that we've come to this. Uh, Davi, do you worry about wearing the Bitcoin symbol now? Do you think that your hoodie is a call to action for government authorities? I'm going to wear it from now on, so we'll find out. And uh, just a call to the rest of the group. Uh, if anyone else would like to uh, comment on the TSA checking your bags for Bitcoin. Chris J., what do you think about that? Yeah, I've just been looking up on Wikipedia, actually. So it looks like this uh, organization came in around 9-11. Is that right? Uh, just as a response to... Um, I would say I don't really have a lot to add on because I'm not really an expert on it. What I would say is that um, I, I, I would like to see somebody use a brain wallet go over a border because then all you've got to do is remember a passphrase, right? And uh, it literally, you're just, you're just entrusting your Bitcoins on, on the blockchain. Um, so I don't even think, you don't even have to pass through with any kind of QR code, anything physically on you at all. Um, you can just store the, the Bitcoins on the blockchain, they're pervasive. And remember that the private key doesn't even have to be a QR code. We're really talking about a string of numbers and letters that could be written down anywhere 
in the person's supplies or on their systems and parts. There's a variety of ways to sneak a number through. Uh, Jason King, Sean's Outpost. You might be muted. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm not muted. Am I, am no, I you're on now? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I had a, a similar experience to Davi in December. Um, I actually I went to the um, the Dark Wallet meetup uh, in Milan, Italy, and um, and I was actually detained um, by customs coming back into the U.S., um, which had never happened to me before. Uh, you know, taken off into a separate room and 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 interrogated. Um, and they did a similar thing. Um, my old uh, business cards were actually these little embroidered Bitcoin patches um, that just had a Sean, the Sean's Outpost QR code on the back of them. And you know, I had 50 of them in in that bag. And they pulled them out, and it was the same thing. It's like, well, what's the monetary value of these? It's like, well, there's no monetary value to these. These are patches. And then actually pulled out my new business card so they could compare the QR codes between these Bitcoin patches. And so it's like. The incompetence there is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's funny because as soon as the word Bitcoin came out, they got um, noticeably concerned. And then you know they brought in another person, and then uh, and I wasn't speaking very much because I, I don't. But the whole thing was fairly comical to me. Um, they uh, they actually called my wife to verify who I was, um, and my my lovely wife. Um, so they called them and they said, who is this? And my wife is like, you called me. You identify yourself. <laughs> um, and then so, uh, you know, they went through, through that. And, uh, and they were, you know, they wanted me to, they had a million questions on Bitcoin. And why, why would anyone in Italy care about Bitcoin? Like, why would someone from the United States go to Italy to speak on Bitcoin? Um, and I was just like, you know, I don't know what to tell you, man. Um, and, you know, my attorney is angry at me as hell because I didn't have them call him um, and I should have. You should call your attorney if that happens. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so similar thing. The TSA is ridiculous. I think I, I applaud Andreas. I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, but in that checkpoint I actually tried to turn, I had my, hand, my phone um, and they actually took my phone from me. So I, I don't know if you're in that situation at the at the border, I don't know if you can if you can do that because they did physically take my phone away from me. So um, yeah, and they, yeah, did, you can't, they also you can't do it yeah. to the border. Uh, in the border, you're in a complete no man's land, um, yeah. which uh, they've managed to carve out not just an exception to the Fourth Amendment, uh, but pretty much do whatever the hell they want, uh, which is wonderful because all of these people remember they take an oath to uphold and protect the United States Constitution. They take that oath above anything else, and then they violate it daily with their actions. Um, in the case you're going through a border, I have a completely different procedure. When I'm traveling across international borders, uh, before I depart from my host country, I wipe all of my digital devices completely. Uh, then I travel through the border with uh, completely blank devices. I notify people of my estimated time of arrival, and uh, tell people, including on Twitter, that if I do not arrive within that time frame to call my lawyer and escalate the situation, uh, I expect one of these days I will be detained. Not for anything I've done, not because they have anything uh, to accuse me with, uh, but just for basic harassment to hold me for a few hours, uh, ask me annoying questions to which I will give them no answers, uh, and eventually they're going to have to let me in. Uh, as a U.S. citizen, you have the absolute right of repatriation. Uh, it is a right protected both under the U.S. Constitution, it has been validated by the Supreme Court, and it has also been validated by the U.N. Charter of Human Rights. Uh, you have the right to enter your own country, and they can only detain you temporarily, ask you annoying questions to which you answer none of them, uh, and repeat the same word over and over again uh, until they let you go, and that word is lawyer. Christoph, I, I agree. I, I, Sorry. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry. No, no, that that was just agreeing with Andreas. That's 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 a good idea. So, good, Christoph. Yeah. Um, any of these badged officials, I don't really trust them to uh, to uphold some stuff that someone wrote on a piece of paper. Um, you know, some of them will take it seriously and some of them won't. And by stuff written on paper, I mean the Constitution or, or other laws. Um, so I think if you're in a public area, 
and you're within the, the borders of your own country, I guess I really only know about the United States, I'm pretty US-centric in that regard, uh, go ahead and film them, because they'll, they'll take note of that, and if they tackle you and take your phone out of your hand, then maybe someone else films them doing that. Um, if they take you into a private area, I wouldn't necessarily take that same approach for the reason that I don't really trust them to, to follow laws. I mean, these are a bunch of people that... Uh, their job is to molest people on a daily basis or radiate them. Would you like some radiation or would you like some molestation? Um, that's 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 their version of would you like fries with that. So um, and then you know when you're going through the border, I definitely like Andreas's idea of of wiping uh, the device. I think that's a very good idea, especially if you have bitcoins on your mobile device. Um, you don't want to give them access to that. Um, if you don't want to wipe the device, like probably the best thing you can do is just turn it off and make sure that it has a strong uh, passcode. Like on my phone usually I just have like a four digit you know whatever to unlock the phone. When I travel next week to go to the Texas Bitcoin conference I'm definitely going to apply a strong password on there. And if the NSA you know comes up to me and says hey can I take a look at your phone, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it off and then it'd say, you know, I'd rather not do that and so forth, but if they, you know, take it from me, uh, at least they'd need to, they'd have to do some kind of sophisticated hacking uh, technique to get access to it. Um, so I, I think those are those are all in, important points, and, um, yeah, probably the best thing to do is, is to, to wipe your machine um, if you're going to go into any kind of private space or if you're if you're going over the border, uh, one one video that I saw was um, this was a border crossing. The uh, guy is crossing the border and they say, um, okay, I, I, you need to prove that you're coming to the country for the right reason. So uh, call, you know, give me give us the phone number for your friend. And he pulls it up on his phone and the agent's like, oh, let me see that. He takes the phone and you know supposedly to jot down the number and then he just disappears into a back room with the phone unlocked for like an hour and who knows what happened there did they copy all the information off the phone uh, did they uh, install a some kind of rootkit on the phone like you don't know um, so just be very careful about what, how you uh, handle your your mobile devices especially if you have money on your, your on your device or some kind of uh, record of financial transactions that's also very sensitive Megan Lords. So I haven't flown in uh, several years since they added the scanners uh, in the airport. And um, with the Texas Bitcoin Conference, I was in a bit of a dilemma. It has been resolved. I will be driving over from Pensacola, but originally I was flying. And from the minute I uh, bought the plane ticket, I had extreme anxiety about going because I think it's a really messed up situation to make someone choose between being irradiated and molested. And I think it's a I mean, I, I understand why people opt out, and I totally am supportive of whatever people do, do. People doing whatever they need to to feel safe. I think it puts certain people in very dangerous situations when they have this awful decision that no one should ever have to make where you may have to opt out and be sexually assaulted, especially if you're a survivor of sexual assault. Um, it's very triggering and very, uh, you know, terrifying. And so I was, I was kind of working through this dilemma. I don't want to let this agency stop me from flying and traveling the country, which is something I've always wanted to do. I haven't been able to leave the U.S., but I do hope to for some of these conferences overseas, and I don't want to be hindered by that. Um, my personal uh, position on it is that I probably would try to record uh, the entire interaction, but try to go through the scanner because I think it's worse for people to be putting their hands on me than going through a scanner where at least it's, it's going to be inappropriate, but at least they can't touch me. So that's kind of my position on it. I know it's not a super popular one because I, have, I know a lot of libertarians tend to say, oh, well, you should opt out because it shows them that you're resisting. But I, I think it's a false, I think it's a trap. I think they, you know, there's a lot of sickos in the TSA who I'm sure are hoping, you know, women especially opt out. Um, and, you know, even, even, trying to lay low, there's no guarantee that you're not going to be randomly selected for a pat-down either. 
Um, it's a disgusting situation, but it's, I'm not going to let it stop me from traveling abroad. It's something I've really thought a lot about the past several months, um, you know, changing my position on it, because I had a very strict no-flying policy. I will drive all over the country, and I have for years now, to avoid specifically going through that. But um, it's something that I'm not going to let stand in my way, and I really appreciate the tips that have been given uh, by Andreas and others about how to uh, deal with the situation by videotaping it and having an attorney that you can, co you know, contact readily available. Thankfully, I've gotten in touch with a good attorney uh, lately, and uh, I think those are all really, really useful uh, tips. Um, and yeah, it does come down to survival when dealing with these people. They're thugs. They have no respect for human life, and uh, you have to outsmart them at every uh, turn. You know, I think it's really ironic that uh, here we are having this conversation in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and essentially what we're talking about is um, a whole number of law-abiding citizens who have broken absolutely no law, who are engaging in lawful activity primarily related to speech, not even anything else but speech. Um, by going to conferences and speaking about technology, a completely lawful activity. And here we are having to take defensive measure, measures against highly, highly intrusive, arbitrary, capricious, and ubiquitous searches that have nothing to do with law enforcement, uh, that have nothing to do with authority vested in them by any part of law or the Constitution. And we're the weirdos. We're the weirdos for trying to simply exercise our lawful right to speech uh, without being molested for it. Uh, it it's really shocking, uh, and increasingly, I think, for many people, it's, it's becoming a reason to leave the United States and try to avoid travel either through or inside the United States as much as possible, uh, because, uh, you know, it gives far too many opportunities uh, for you to be harassed uh, extrajudicially. Uh, with no justification in law for activities that are entirely lawful. I haven't broken any law. Um, I keep my nose 100% clean. I do my taxes. I, <laughs> you know, I, I do everything by the book because I have a high profile and because I'm an honest person. And yet, uh, here we are essentially taking defensive measures against our own government. It is absolutely disgusting. I think it's worth pointing I think out it also that it's got... It's got nothing to do with security either. Like, between Jason and I, apparently the TSA has managed to find two Bitcoin charities, but they've never found a terrorist. <laughs> they've found plenty of tubes of toothpaste and bottles of water, but <laughs> they've never actually thwarted any security risk in an airport. So, like, to, to, it's like, it's not just, it's not bad enough that it's security theater. That play is also a tragedy. <laughs> It's designed to train people to uh, unquestionably conform to authority, authority that isn't even uh, lawful in many cases, an authority that is ever expanding, ever more intrusive, and ever more detached from the original concepts uh, of security that uh, provided the excuse to start it, and it trains people to just unquestionably follow this authority. And that is the kind of training that we should be avoiding in this country or in any country. Uh, it is a very pernicious and poisonous idea to train people that any time they see a badge in a uniform, they should do exactly as told regardless of their uh, of their rights, uh, regardless of the uh, legality of the situation, and just simply shut up and play along, uh, because that's what the people need to feel secure. That is poisonous for democracy, and is a very dangerous precedent. These are training academies for totalitarianism. Yeah, the, the yeah, authority you're it, talking about, Andreas, is being vested in, in abject dunces. I mean, we've heard all the stories and the thefts and the things like that, but just what happened to Davi underscores it perfectly, and, and even Jason's experience, too. You know, showing up and asking them, you know, I love Davi, I, what you wrote in your, in your uh, recount of this thing, asking them, are you sure you know what a Bitcoin is? May I speak with your supervisor? I mean, this is, this is the, the dangerous potential here for, for this kind of authority to run amok. I, I don't know how, how we figured or what 
um, you know, these policymakers figured would be such a great idea about vesting authority in, in such dunces, except for the fact that they would unquestioningly carry out their, their, their policies. Um, and, and for some reason, because they wear fancy uniforms and badges um, and, and, you know, can call on, call on the dog, so to speak, if there's any real trouble going on, that everyone just falls in line and conforms. And that's, that's the saddest part for me. I, I find when I go through these checkpoints and things, I just shut up. And I really like the point, the, the tips you gave. All, you know, some of the panelists gave great tips, especially Andreas's tip about filming. Uh, I've thought of doing that a number of times, but never really knew a full comprehensive process of how to do it. And, and Andreas, you gave that to me, so thank you. But just, I just end up shutting up. I don't look anybody in the eye. And I just try to get it over with and hope that, you know, I'm not selective, uh, you know, selected for a random, um, you know, ad enhanced pat-down or, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's a terrible ordeal. It's awful. <laughs> Uh, freedom is reasonable suspicion, Will. All that activity you're doing, asserting your rights, believing in the Constitution, sounds really damn suspicious to me. I think uh, more pat-downs are, are in store for you. Uh, Derek J. Yeah, I haven't flown in over 10 years because my last experience flying the TSA stole hundreds of dollars of cologne from me. Uh, because they were in bottles over three ounces. So I'm surprised that Davi's pins weren't stolen. You know, and I have to say I'm impressed with Davi's ability to record right after, you know, as soon as possible. You got the word out, and that was the reason I think that this story w became so big, was because you got some sort of uh, record while you were in the airport of what was happening to you. Uh, it's audio, it's an objective record. It even spread as far as InfoWars. And it's no doubt because you are reporting this story that more people are going to take precautions when they go flying the next time. And the intersection of the TSA and Bitcoin is particularly interesting to me because the TSA is this organization that's designed to protect borders, right? These imaginary lines uh, through which things can't pass. And they're the, the guards, they're the checkpoint uh, between you and the outside world. But with Bitcoin, as we've been talking about, the the borders are meaningless. You can cross uh, the borders with the Bitcoin in your brain uh, if you're using a brain wallet. Um, so the TSA looking for physical representations of Bitcoin is really a, a lost cause. And uh, the most important takeaway that I can communicate to the crowd is that they're going to seize what they want. Re Constitution aside, uh, they have the guns and the authority and the badges. So they're going to take what they want, whether or not they, they're, they're not going to like check all the coins to see their value before stealing them. They steal things first and then later give them back if they were wrong. But there's no apology. So if, if you want to protect yourself, record. And another tip that we haven't mentioned yet is an arm trick that a lot of people have used with success in the past where you opt out, you go for the pat down, and then you say, I just tore my rotator cuff, I can't lift my arm above my head. They say, fine, they're apparently prepared for this sort of objection, and you get a classic style metal detector. No invasive pat down needed. Excellent. And I guess we'll move on to question, uh, well, I was going to try to skip question and answers, but they look pretty good. Um, let's see. Starting off with uh, The Daily Show. Does it hurt or help that Bitcoin was mentioned briefly on The Daily Show? For those of you who aren't familiar, The Daily Show mentioned Bitcoin and, of course, the Mt. Gox collapse. They quickly drew the parallel between Bitcoin and Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs was, of course, too big to fail and now has acquired yellow cake uranium through a various business dealings. So Goldman Sachs is closer than Iran to getting the bomb. And that was pretty much The Daily Show's coverage. I think it's a good thing. All press is a good thing. So, so this is the thing. Good press for Bitcoin is great. It's good press. It gives us brand awareness. Bad press for Bitcoin is good press because it gives us brand awareness. Mediocre press for Bitcoin is good press because it gives us brand awareness. 
Uh, pronunciations that Bitcoin is dead is good press because people check three weeks later and guess what? Bitcoin isn't dead and that's good brand awareness. Every time Bitcoin is mentioned, Bitcoin, 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 someone hears it and Bitcoin, 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 the fourth time they buy some and they join. Uh, because the more they hear the government saying you shouldn't touch this Bitcoin, and they know exactly how trustworthy the government is, and they know exactly how trustworthy the banks are. The banks issue warnings against Bitcoin, people buy Bitcoin. The government issues warnings against Bitcoin, people buy Bitcoin. People say Bitcoin's good, people buy Bitcoin. Anything you do promotes the brand. Say whatever the hell you want about me. Just spell my name right. B I T C O I N, Bitcoin. Excellent. Well said. Does anyone want to comment on the endless stream of Bitcoin flowing into China on fiatleak.com? It's truly mesmerizing to watch. Now, everybody comment at once. I think it's very exciting that China is still buying Bitcoin, considering the temporary ban that was later restricted to only a bank ban. Okay, it wasn't even a temporary ban, it was always just a bank ban. And again, this represents the type of negative publicity that is reducing the credibility of the media while creating brand awareness for Bitcoin. Uh, they said China banned Bitcoin and the volume didn't change. And who did that cause to lose credibility? Uh, Bitcoin or the media? Uh, every time the media tries to discredit Bitcoin, it discredits itself. Uh, because you look three weeks later, Bitcoin's still there. Uh, I'd like to urge everyone to uh, make sure, make sure that Bitcoin is still there. Uh, visit isbitcoindead.com. Uh, visit it every single day. Refresh it in your browser. Just to check, isbitcoindead.com. And guess what? The answer is always no. <laughs> Excellent. How likely is it for merchants to offer customers discount that pay in Bitcoin instead of credit card? I would say they're already offering it. Tiger Direct has offered a special discount for Bitcoin. Overstock.com is working on a special discount for Bitcoin. The more we see merchants that go through a pretty similar pattern, first they need to know what Bitcoin is, then they can accept it, then they realize how much they're saving from not paying credit card fees, and they realize that if they could increase the amount of Bitcoin they're taking in, they could reduce their amount of fees. So it makes <laughs> obvious sense for them to add a little discount for Bitcoin paying customers. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm talking uh, with a small coffee shop around here who's interested in starting to accept Bitcoin payments and they're very eager to offer 33% off for one cup of coffee if paid in Bitcoin and happy to hold on to all those Bitcoins and not pay you know, I think what they for a dollar and seventy-five cents cup of coffee, they pay like a flat fee for the credit card fee if it's paid in a credit card, not the three percent or whatever it is. It's like a dollar twenty-five that they have to pay their merchant processor uh, or or Visa indirectly or whatever it may be. So they're very excited about a thirty-three percent discount for a cup of coffee, and I guarantee you that will lead to a lot of people who shop there daily. Um, exploring what this Bitcoin thing's all about. Exactly, Will, and what a wonderful loyalty program for customers. You come back every day, you pay with Bitcoin, you get a discount every day. The business profits and so do you. Well, this is how deflationary currency is supposed to work, right? You're supposed to discount and incentivize. Well, look at the underlying premise of inflation. What they're trying to do is they're trying to control your spending behavior. But the thing is we don't even want the junk that's on sale. So by devaluing my money, you're actually going to get less of what you want. It's absolutely appropriate that merchants discount their products uh, for, for these deflationary currencies. Excellent. Absolutely. Moving on, the next question, uh, and this may or may not be true. I've read a disturbing post on Reddit where somebody apparently shot his brains out because of his loss of Gox BTC. And I'd like to say, just as a community, these reports could be fake or they could be real. If they're fake, we need to shrug them off and not be grossed out about it. But if they're real, we probably need to set up some type of funds to try to help these people, some outreach to provide con you know, condolences and whatever we can do because people have lost a great deal of money and there is going to be this feeling and this sentiment through the community and hopefully we can reverse it, uh, you know, help the people affected by it and you know, fight it. So, anyone else thoughts on that? 
in Roger Ver's video about Mt. Gox, he used a really interesting phrase. He said that he lost a life-altering amount of Bitcoin. And I thought that that was really interesting because it's not a numerical value. It's sort of, it's very subjective. Each person would describe a life-altering amount of value differently. Um, but you have to, I think of it like, when I heard this story, I thought of it like this. Like, Bitcoin set a lot of people free. And like, so people that grew up sort of feeling like they didn't have a future, feeling like they didn't have a retirement, feel like they would never see the wealth that they saw around them, feeling like they were born into a cage and stuck there, uh, sort of felt free for the first time in their life. And this happened to me to some extent. And so to have that then taken away from them, it's like a bird breaking out of a cage only to discover he broke into another cage. And I could see that being truly tragic and heartbreaking. Um, and so I guess what I would say to everyone is that it isn't just about the amount that's in your account, it's about the future that's being built. And so even if you lost something, it's worth staying in the game because we don't really know how fantastic a future we're building is yet. Yeah, I want to I wanna echo that, Davi. You know, I... Tell friends of mine after they've come around to Bitcoin that, you know, when they ask really why I got involved or whatever, that um, I saw it as a way to save my life, to give me new motivation, um, to recreate myself, new confidence. And I had a couple times since I've, you know, owned any Bitcoins where I lost almost all of them, um, embarrassing situations even things that were, you know, close to life ruining. And I never wanted to leave the game because of what this technology provides, which at least for me personally was a way to, uh, you know, I always tell people, you know, I, I wanted to be involved in all kinds of different activism and organizations and things like that that I kind of agreed with, mostly agreed with or whatever. But there was always something about them that I couldn't completely get behind. And I know I had some gifts to share with the world, and all of us do. Every single one of you watching out there does. And Bitcoin came along, and it finally was that one thing that there was nothing about it that I could not get behind. And so that's why I jumped in with both feet. And that's why I stayed around, even when some embarrassing moments happened where I lost nearly almost all of uh, my, my Bitcoin wealth. And it's... It's because of that that um, you, you know that it's because of that that uh, that we all should stick around and we should all you know get one Satoshi again and and just put your put your gifts to work give your gifts to the world um, you know it really brought me out of my shell and it really allowed me to give gifts to the world that uh, that had been couched up or, or bottled up um, so I'm so so grateful to this community and this technology, Satoshi Nakamoto, him, her, or they, themselves. Um, and please, stick around. Stick around with us. Reach out to people. Uh, you'll find, I mean, I, I couldn't ask for a better family, the, the biggest family in the world probably. And I don't um, often, you know, I don't think any of my family's watching, so I can probably say I've not felt a sense of family from my own family. I know a lot of folks have that experience. But I have not, you know, my small young family that I have, you know, um, my fiancé and our child, we have this immense caring family that we feel from the Bitcoin community all the time. And if you don't feel that yet, and you've been involved in Bitcoin and you had a huge loss recently, please just open up your, your mouth a little bit to, to some folks nearby, and we'll come and, and embrace you. Yeah, don't don't go posting on Reddit. You may not find too many uh, sympathetic ears. Don't go to but Reddit. <laughs> if you're feeling despair, if you're uh, if you've lost a large amount of money and you're feeling despair, um, beyond reaching out to the community uh, in the U.S. at least, uh, there there are support structures available. There are in many other countries. In the U.S., there's a there's a 24-hour uh, suicide hotline where you can talk to people who can give you hope uh, and who can help you work through that despair. Uh, the number for that is 1-800-273-TALK. 
Uh, that's uh, 2738255. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, the story is true. Uh, I, I certainly hope it isn't, because for me, Bitcoin has been life-altering in a positive way. Uh, and it's not because I invested all of my money in Bitcoin and made a lot of money. Uh, it's because I invested all of my skills in Bitcoin and I've learned so much. And because I invested a lot of my social interactions in Bitcoin and I've met incredible people. And because I've invested a lot of my hope in Bitcoin and I've been rewarded back with hope. Um, and I hope out of Bitcoin you get not the money, not the return, but the investment in community, in hope. Uh, in the possibilities of a technology and in your own skills that will give you a lifetime of opportunity to earn uh, and perhaps if you've made a loss to earn back. Uh, so don't give up and if you need help call the, call the National Suicide Helpline. Uh, don't despair. Absolutely. Good advice, Andreas. We have uh, one more question tonight for Chris J. I'm a UK resident and have an account with Gox and have lost a lot. Is it possible here for me to go to a lawyer to file a lawsuit, or would that be pointless, as Gox is in Japan? Uh, well, I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not uh, in a position to give any legal advice, but I do understand that on um, the B Bitcoin Talk Forum, somebody was talking about doing a class action lawsuit. So I, I'm, it's pretty searchable on Google. If you type in uh, MT Gox class action, um, that should come up, uh, because it got a lot of posts, I believe, on, on the forum. But I'm, I'm not a legal expert, I'm afraid. Really sorry. Absolutely. But check out for a class action lawsuit. There may be something in your country or your area. So don't give up hope completely, but accept your losses and do what you can to move on and, and rebuild. Yeah. We're moving on to everyone's favorite part of the show, predictions. The part where I ask you to predict the future, and perhaps you didn't prepare anything. Andreas has already suddenly disappeared. That means you know it's prediction time. We're looking at you, Davi Barker. I'm predicting that the Austin Bitcoin Conference is going to be awesome. I'm predicting that um, we're going to meet a lot of cool people, see a lot of cool announcements, and that we're going to sort of set the tone for, uh, for Bitcoin moving forward. Chris, J. I predict that... After this grand mistake of outsourcing our wealth management, we're also going to outsource some of our thinking. And lots of people are going to be blaming Bitcoin on this problem. But I also uh, predict that lots of people are going to come to the defense of Bitcoin. And a lot of people in this space are going to redouble their efforts. This is going to make us even stronger. Um, I'm working on the Bitcoin fight, which is uh, on the 5th of April. We've got a show at the O2 involving some kickboxing for Bitcoin. It's going to be the biggest Bitcoin event of the year. Just thought I'd plug that. You know. And uh, I think that even like the sense that I get with Start Join, you know, um, this new sort of crowdfunding thing that Max Kais has launched, everyone just is more energized. Now this has happened, we want to fight back even more. So I think I th anticipate more stuff going on as a result of this. Jason King. Oh, you got to unmute. No, still can't hear you. We appear to have lost Jason King. Can you hear us, Jason? Uh, Hello? There you go. We Anybody? Can you got me? Yep. Okay. Um, so prediction. Um, I predict I'm going to continuously burn out running shoes for the next three and a half months. Um, and uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Davi. I think that the uh, the Texas Bitcoin Conference in Austin is gonna be killer. Uh, if you haven't checked out the lineup there, it is it's amazing. I think it's gonna be a very synergetic event. I hate the word synergy. I think it's overused, but the sort of mass of Bitcoiners in one space combined with uh, with the South by Southwest and all of the the people that that attracts in one spot. I think Austin is gonna be off the chain next week, and I think uh, if you can you can be part of it, you should be part of it because I predict it's going to be amazing. Christoph Atlas. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, conference. Um, hopefully, someone, uh, at least a couple people, will show up to my talk, which is scheduled at the same time as uh, Stefan Molyneux. But uh, you know, then the breaks. <laughs> um, in terms of predictions. Um, 
uh, I think that there's going to be this tension between uh, government regulation and self-regulation. Uh, the Bitcoin uh, e economy, the Bitcoin community is ready to come forward with some amazing uh, self-regulation, some crypto regulation, uh, a new form of regulation that has not previously existed on this planet. They have responses to these mistakes. And uh, that's all we need. But the government is also going to try to take this opportunity to step in and say, hey, we told you so. Uh, we, need the, we need our guardrails and our uh, Nintendo lost keys and so forth. And so I'm very curious to see how that will play out in the, the court of public opinion. Um, I think that the way that people will uh, process that information will be important. And so it's very important to us to keep beating the drums of this new crypto, crypto regulation and letting people know that we don't need some uh, strange uh, kleptocrat to step in and, and uh, try and fix things for us. Megan Lords. Christoph said uh, what I was basically going to say. I think we're going to see some decentralized solutions come out of this. Uh, you know, improved escrow services, even uh, competing insurance services too. Uh, not necessarily like you know the FDIC or something, but uh, I think something along those lines. Uh, you know, will be interesting to come out of it. And I'm really excited about the Texas Bitcoin Conference. Also, I uh, I think that's going to be great. And uh, yeah, I definitely look forward to participating in that. So, Derek J. I'm excited about the Texas Bitcoin Conference and Michelle Seven's Big Barbecue Bash, which I think you're all attending. As politicians uh, seek to steal your Bitcoin at the airport, ban it in your state, and call you an extremist for trying to use Bitcoin to feed the homeless, I predict people are quickly going to learn about the current situation of freedom in this world and take action to do something about it starting with trading in free currencies like Bitcoin and building the free future we all want to see. Will Pangman. I'm going to go for a dry prediction, but uh, a topic no one's mentioned yet, so um, maybe it's a little fresh for that reason. Uh, we're going to see some more m misinformation, clumsy stuff come out of Mt. Gox in terms of statements and um, you know, diluted facts and vagaries. And that will, of course, produce some FUD in the community, and we'll see a drop in price again, a, maybe not uh, substantial, but significant, uh, followed by our next major rally past 1,000 and staying there. And my prediction, Bitcoin adoption wave continues to sweep America. After the Sacramento Kings successfully adapt Bitcoin in March, Major League Baseball will seek to become Major League Bitcoin. Will America's pastime also become America's first Major League sporting event to accept Bitcoin? Are they really that smart? We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>